Good evening, primetime partiers. It's primetime party time. Welcome back to our Hour of All Things Media and Entertainment, live on the air at 9 p.m. at ptptshow.com and on your time, wherever you stream podcasts. Tonight, we are revisiting, reliving, and analyzing yet another cult-followed, underrated show, Eli Stone, in our recurring segment, Ghosts of Prime Times Past. Danny and I will give our toasts and roasts of this past week before getting down and dirty with Eli Stone, a show you can really only find on the ABC mobile app, so truly a hidden treasure. I'm Tracy, and this is our (laughs) co-host. I'm Daniel. That's very true. Also, uh, we're back to shows uh, that feature the protagonist in their title this week. There we go. So. Yeah, this is that's it's all the time. <laughs> that's all you can go off of. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, you're right. This this one was a hard one to find. This is this is gonna be fun. This is a real deep cut. Uh, and uh, yeah, but before before that, uh, good evening. Uh, what are we toasting to? What are you roasting to tonight? Yeah, well, thank you everyone for being here, listeners, and let's get into it. So my toast is that I got a haircut. Now that the salons have opened in California, um, so I chopped off a good six inches to be like, let's get rid of all of that 2020 dead weight. <laughs> now that we're in 2021, full into the Lunar New Year, I was like, it's time. Let's do this. Um, and yeah, if you are somewhat near, I drive to this person, but if you shout out to Julia Does Hair, I think her website is julia and all that hair at one to one salon in irvine so if you need a cut okay go see her might hit her up i give her little instructions and she always knows what i mean which is a very key trait to an awesome stylist and also got to see some buddies in person for the first time in like a year so that was really nice. Got to go to the beach in February. The weather was pretty good. I kind of thought it would be really bad. I looked at the weather and I was like, I'm going to bring a down jacket to the beach. It's going to be cold. And it ended up being in the 70s and I really could have been in the water. So I had some regrets, but it did get colder later because it is t- still technically winter. So, you know, not fully regret, but half regret but in any other sense it was really good to see people for the first time in a long time and yeah revving up to turning 28 at the end of this week so nice oh happy early birthday for the show thank you i know daniel in front of the pod gifted me a dragon ball z nimbus pillow which I feel like I have randomly dropped in conversation before that. I'm like, I've always wanted a pillow that would be like those clouds. So very thoughtful gift from the pod. Thank you. Um, And yeah, my roast is tied into what we're drinking tonight, which since we're watching Eli Stone, we figured why not have a stone beer, even though all the lawyers had little liquor cabinets in their cubbies, like we really could have done anything. But we went with the namesake. And all of the cans are upside down. And they're saying it's a marketing tactic called no stone left unturned. And part of it is that, like, once you, if you were like chugging the beer, then the label is right side up. I am not fully on board with this. I, I think it's mostly that I just look at it and go, oh, no, it's upside down, and then it's not. So, you know, it could just be like, Tracy is not at the level advanced enough to accept this. <laughs> and I'm very clumsy, so it would be me to put my beer upside down. But, yeah, I'm, re- I'm interested and curious if this was, like, actually an intentional thing or a very, uh, you know, clever spin on labeling a bunch of cans upside down. I, I don't know. It's a clever spin, but like I, I'm with you. It, it's not only it's not only the 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 like not the knowing what side of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so Stone. Sto- Stone's an amazing brewery, and yes. their actual beer gardens are like the Disneyland of beer gardens. It's they are a so beautiful fun. place. Yes. Uh, but uh, another thing that they really do great is like obviously they're you know they're 
on on beer bottles, on beer cans. There's always this like great opportunity to kind of like flex your uh, <laughs> your copywriters' skills at the brewery. Yes. And Stones, their copy is amazing uh, on on all of their bottles, and and it makes it so difficult to read all of the the fun stuff or or even oh, all yeah. the facts about it uh, when they're upside down, or or even sometimes kind of what you're trying to see. Uh, so yeah, I'm with you. I. <laughs> Can't wait till they go right back right side up. Uh, which stone did you get? I did the Tangerine Express IPA. Nice. And I have to say, I do like it. It's one that I will go after if I'm doing a stone. I think the only thing is, like, I haven't been to, a, obviously, a stone beer garden in a very long time. But I, what I yeah. do usually like when I go to there are their, like, Berliner Weiss beers because they're a little bit lighter. I haven't been drinking a ton of IPAs. I think this is something everyone in San Diego hits where you realize like, oh man, I can't drink this many IPAs. <laughs> I need to mix it up with some lighter beers because my stomach cannot handle having like this much bread, <laughs> liquid bread <laughs> yeah, at totally. all times. I mean, but I am having it and being like, oh, I... I used to go to, there was also like a small tasting room right by the Santa Fe Depot station in downtown. And when I used to commute, I would just be like, I'd try to grab someone and be like, let's just have a little sneaky beer before I hit the road. Yeah, And it was really nice. So I do miss little things like that, that I hope will return in the coming months. But yeah, so. still question mark if anyone has any intel on the situation with the upside down beer labels, please drop it into the chat or leave us a voicemail at ptptshow.com. We're interested. We want answers. <laughs> I, do, I do want answers. There are answers we probably get. Uh, yeah, I think so. I went with the uh, the Stone Soaring Dragon Imperial IPA, Ooh. which is uh, inspired Obvious by... Fabulous name. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, it... It's inspired by uh, they, they had a tasting room that they actually opened up in Shanghai, uh, and I think oh, that they right. like shuttered it uh, early last year due to increasing oh. tariffs and, and COVID. So I would pour yeah. some out for it, but I also want my deposit back. So I'm just going to drink <laughs> this entire thing uh, that actually has a, apparently um, is, is this imperial IPA loaded with white tea is the result of a bountiful trip to Shanghai and the resulting experimentation. We love setting aside preconceived notions and celebrating new learnings and new perspectives. The amazing aromas and flavor profile of this beer are witness to the joys of experimentation and a testament to making time for side trips. Uh, and you can't I read love that. that. That also sounds very much up my flavor profile alley. I heard white tea. And I was mm -hmm. like, I would like this beer. And that label was right side up. So that must have been from like a... <laughs> that was actually kind of why I picked it. Um, yeah, that's that's not from this batch. That's from a special batch. Right. Mm. Um, but yeah, and I guess with that, uh, to Eli Stone, I guess I'll toast this week to... Uh, you, you ever watch those YouTube channels, the like smaller ones that are just like down to business? You know, like they follow all the practices of like the bigger YouTube channels, but without all of the like bloated promotion they just kind of get you in and out and they like follow the skill but not the game of it uh and our productions is doing that uh if you're into the like van camp living uh kind of like game uh they do those they do uh maintenance videos they do uh uh like campsite reviews uh That's and cool. and they're a friend of the show so i know uh firsthand that a, a new season of campsite reviews will be coming in the spring uh so toast nice. to AR and uh and a big roast uh to uh, our viewing experience. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Eli Stone. Um, uh, Love the show, Stone Builders too. but the ABC mobile app is, guys, there's a reason these shows live on other platforms now because <laughs> we all remember the days of going to each network's individual website and watching the show. Like, it was usually like 2 a.m. the day after or sometimes you had to wait a week to see the episode if you didn't watch it when it was live or didn't have a way to record it. And I know how I'm sounding right now. It's like, really, it was that bad for you? Listen, it was. Things have progressed. Like even with Hulu, yes. Do I start memorizing the same ads that I have seen? Like, yes. Do I somewhat 
know that Ralph's commercial where they're dancing to get low? Yes, I do know that one. Do I start to memorize all the side effects for various medications that make you wonder why is this being targeted to me? I don't appreciate that. Uh, those, those things happen. But for ABC.com, I was just like, oh, it was very clunky. I think that's the best way I can say it. I it's had a like massive would... uh, like glitch where the episode would continue playing under the advertisements. And so you'd get yes. the entire six ad break and, and the episode would still play under it to a point where you were a scene ahead uh, by the time that you were back in the episode. And that was both on desktop and mobile had its, had its issues too. Uh, but I suppose Eli Stone is, is a series that at the moment... Uh, no streaming service or ABC thought in, in either way that licensing it would be more profitable than uh, shooting ads down the, the throats of whoever uh, wanted uh, to watch it on ABC.com. And so here we are. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I so. was surprised we could watch it for free in such a way. Yeah. And I also, but then was equally surprised at like, well, this is why I can watch it for free randomly it's because you're like we're gonna just use the same ad player from probably 2008 (laughs) (laughs) and uh you can watch this show this way i know this is kind of how you know this is one of our deeper cuts because it is not super available on the major streaming apps you do kind of have to hunt for it and yeah like i thought i was going to watch it on a dvd set that my family had and then I found this and I was like whew this will be much easier to airplay to the tv but yeah it's guys it made us feel really grateful for all of our other apps that don't put us through those things it made me go like I'm grateful for you Hulu Netflix love that you don't have ads same for you HBO Max (laughs) seriously yeah big big toast to HBO Max yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. As a, we'll, we'll get into Eli Stone right after the break. But generally, recommend, but don't really at this moment recommend uh, ABC.com if there's another way to listen to it. Okay, Tracy. Yeah. How'd you hear about this? What what, what is this? How, how, how'd you hear about this show? I didn't know this show existed before this week. Yeah. So E Last Down is a family favorite of mine. Um, yeah, it's we first heard about it because one of my second cousin's relatives is uh the what is their character? His name is James Saito, and he plays the kind of like spirit guide slash acupuncturist on this show. So we knew he was on it, and that kind of is what got us to watching it. And yeah, that's that's kind of how we discovered it. Um, we did really like watching it on the air as well. So that was the original way we watched, obviously, since we've kvetched about (laughs) how we have had to watch it this time uh originally obviously very seamless because we just watched it on cable um and it is the best way to describe this show is very much a combination of ally mcbeal and bruce almighty came together and made a show because it is a law courtroom sitcom where the protagonist is a bit neurotic and sees hallucinations of famous singers breaking into song which is very much ally mcbeal but the twist is that he is has a brain aneurysm and it also results in him being a prophet and getting a lot of divine intervention. And it's kind of supposed to be that he approaches the courtroom to make decisions that are more moral and less financially motivated. So this show is created by... Greg Berlanti and Mark Guggenheim. It aired January 31st, 2008, up until July 11th, 2009. So it's a shorter run. The cast is Johnny Lee Miller, Natasha Henstridge, Laura Devine, Richter Garber, James Saito as the main players of this show. 
Um, the seasons and episodes runs is two seasons, 26 episodes. So we are looking at another, if we're looking back and comparing to Don't Trust Be in the Apartment 23, two seasons with 13 episodes each. So that is kind of indicating to us, like at this point in time in television, seasons were running around 13 episodes and kind of got a two season trial before they got picked up and extended yeah and uh, also i believe this was kind of the reason this might have gotten i don't know but the reason this might have gotten that second season like trial and, and a lot of these shows is this was the writer strike year correct yes so maybe that has yeah that that might be perhaps the and then it was just canceled into its second season. But but it definitely, yeah, probably got that second second leg of life through. Um, yeah, through the goodwill that definitely. The strike. I think the writer's strike did impact how probably, some yeah. shows either survived or dipped or even took a break or had a lot shorter seasons. It did happen between 2007 and 2008, and the show went on the air in 2008. So that's that definitely plays a role in both how this kind of got up and running but also maybe why it didn't continue onwards so a little short synopsis of the show is just when eli stone thought he'd found his way his life changed directions on him thanks to some wild visions this high-powered attorney is trading in his big money clients to represent the little guys but as his hallucinations hallucinations grow more vivid he needs to answer the larger question of his true destiny which is true the show is a lot about kind of someone who thought they had it all figured out now going through self-discovery at a later stage in life like he begins the show as a very successful lawyer and he's engaged and he's in a really good place you know i think a lot of law shows are all about like am i gonna make senior partner and all this stuff and he's very much on that track. And then this happens and it really makes him rethink his day to day and his long term of what am I doing to, you know, make the world a better place, but also what is my place in this bigger world? So this that is like the fun part of this show is instead of it being as serious of a courtroom drama as we've seen in like the good wife and boston legal and like those kind of shows you are getting this more like whimsical take of the courtroom where what happens in there is less important and it's more about the interactions and like the results of the courtroom instead of the banter within it so it's it's yeah. like the oh i was able to convince these people to do something because they also kind of believe they were getting a message from above and that's that's like a big part of him just kind of like moving things along in the direction that he thinks is like his visions are telling him to push things so daniel as i've described my ties to the show how has your history of the show been <laughs> well i know more about it after this week than than really ever i really I can't tell if this is one of those ones where I might have like the the splash screen for it or the or the I guess like the, the main screen right. Uh, yes, and it, it's it's somewhat familiar. I, I feel like I would have seen that in advertisements. It's the back of his head, uh, looking at clouds, and then like superimposed in his head is it's like the Eli Stone, um, like masked into the cloud. I don't really know how to describe it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I didn't really know any anything else about this, and so I I, had, I don't think I had ever even heard of it. Uh, and, and most of the shows that still get brought up uh, from this era, like you hear about, um, and then there's like billions and billions of shows, or not billions, but you can look back on on shows of like this network era that lasted like one or two seasons, and nobody's mentioned them since. Nobody's really mentioned this since. I, I tried to go scouring for articles, and outside of like the 2008, 2009 kind of life cycle that the show had, uh, really the only time anyone ever talked about it was around like the time that George Michael passed away in 2016. Yeah. There were a bunch of articles written. Uh, we'll talk about it, but George Michael is a rather integral part of this series. Yes. Uh, otherwise, so some things that I did kind of read about it uh, that I that does kind of add to, to its fun tone that you were describing 
is that so this show started airing it was what would air after season four of lost um, wow on thursday nights so yeah this is it, it's it's cool in this way where articles referred to this as like the it was high concept tv that was all the rage around this time before high concept tv had to be this like second coming of lost which it yeah. did. We saw too many shows like The Event, Revolution, Flash Forward, which actually one of these creators went off to, to go do that had to have the like the, the lost mystery, the lost stakes behind it. This had the high concept, this but this didn't have that like it didn't have the 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 scale to it that these other shows needed to have coming out of like the end of Lost. Uh, and so I, I agree that that's a, a pretty good assessment of like where this show stands. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of really all I knew about it before hitting play on the pilot episode. Yeah. I look to see what other people said about this show as well. And with some of our other shows, you'll see some of them pop the titles pop up on these like bustle or kind of other shows that do the roundups of like, what should you stream on Amazon prime right now? And it hasn't because it's like not on the streaming apps. It doesn't also have that, you know, chance to get repicked up by audiences this way. So it really is one where it's like you have to search to find it. The people who like it really like it, and they probably like it enough to just buy the DVDs and go through it that way. So it is one where, yeah, there hasn't been a ton of commentary on it, which is a fun part for us. We get to kind of unearth that and share it with you guys and we do know that there are some listeners to the show who have watched this show so it's yeah it's it's a very much once you're once you're hooked you're hooked but it it is like one where you have to get into it and it's interesting knowing that it aired after loss because you almost think of it as like a okay you watched this really intense show here's like a show that does have some intensity to it in the sense that there are these like divine intervention themes and a lot of like life and death moral high ground dilemmas but they are packaged in a much more approachable almost sitcom-y way so it's a bit easier to be the like I watch this and then I you know go about the rest of my evening whereas a lot of that like really high drama show you're like I kind of need to take the edge off with something and this is a good show that would fit that while also still kind of being dramatic in its own right. So yes, definitely yeah, good way to describe That's... things. So the pilot, yeah. how did you feel about the pilot, Daniel? So it, it takes me a while to get back into these network shows. Um, early on, I, w- I was very much like, I don't know if I'm going to like this. Uh, within 20 minutes, I was pretty much sold on on the show, its characters, and uh, and they do develop them quite a bit in the pilot alone. Yeah. Uh, you watched this show. I did. And you're watching this show again. You're revisiting it again. So has the show like you said that you loved it when you when you watched it as you were growing up? You still loving it w- revisiting this pilot? Like, w- what are your thoughts on this? I think I don't like I still love it, but there are concepts on this show that I go because like the pilot is about like the first court case is a mother who's suing a vaccine developer on. I think this part of this vaccine gave my kid autism, which we all know is not science. Um, So the fact that that made it into a plot line, you're like, that's kind of bad on the writers. Um, and especially watching it with the lens of 2021, you're like, excuse you, do not be pushing an anti-vaxxer agenda. (laughs) Um, and that is, and it's funny. I mean, it's not funny, but it's, it's interesting that like, that was something that could be like debated about on network television during that time was like, oh, there's could be people who think this. And now that's very taboo thing to think to the pack. You know, you could even go on to say it is moronic to think. So it's it's interesting that it's in a plot line on here. So I think watching that now and being like, this kind of went over my head as a <laughs> viewer in my early teens. 
And now I see this and go like cringe a little bit. But yeah, I think yeah. I was just gonna say I don't. The only the only thing that was like really odd about it is that because it's a okay. So I guess so. Eli Stone like just he gets this brain aneurysm and he starts getting these visions, right? Yes. Um, and and a lot of these visions have to do with like this sort of gospely. It, it's the George Michael song, right? Gotta have faith. Yeah. That's specifically Gotta his vision. Faith. He, he faith. sees George faith. Michael. Yeah, exactly. He sees I George Michael in his living room singing the song. And he actually goes to uh, James Saito's character, Dr. Chen. And yes. Dr. Chen, his immediate kind of like justification, or not justification, but uh, revelation for like what these visions are is that it has to be a concept like God, right? Like the, yeah. that, that is what it is. Um, and, and so Eli starts kind of following that as being the source of his visions. And what makes the, the, the actual case somewhat strange as that kind of ties up is that they win the case, not on evidence, but on the argument no. of faith, which he, which he kind of comes to throughout the episode. And so it's really interesting because, this is, it's a good pilot and yeah. it has strong characters. It has strong storylines with all of the characters. Uh, Dr. Chen's character who I was like somewhat, I was like, Oh no, like who is this character? Will he like, w they give him a lot of depth in the pilot alone. They kind of subvert yeah. your expectations of who he's going to be uh, in the second half of the pilot. And Eli actually comes back to them and they, they develop a friendship over the series uh, that's actually pretty great in the episodes that I watched. Yeah. Uh, but the 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 actual courtroom stuff, minus uh, the guest star in this episode, Laura Benanti, uh, who stole her scenes. And she really did. <laughs> they ended up bringing her back so, uh, for a couple episodes, it looked like. Yeah. Uh, the the whole argument of like Faith getting, getting to the point of the courtroom, it's kind of like you said, like this show works not despite but apart from its courtroom setting. Yeah. Whereas like shows like Ally McBeal sound, I haven't seen it, sound like it thrives in its courtroom. Uh, shows like Eli Stone, it, it shines outside of its courtroom. And in the courtroom, honestly, in the pilot episode, it seemed like obligatory for how do we, how do we sell the show as like a legal drama to get it on the air? Uh, yeah. Because the show would work in different workplaces. Bruce Almighty works well in the newsroom. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. It's interesting that the 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 actual cases stuff. It, you're right. Like the banter, the wit that wins the courtroom, um, the cases themselves, like as shown as early as this pilot episode, aren't really the heart and soul of the show. But all of the court drama stuff that, or not the court drama, all of the like firm stuff, like all the law yeah. firm stuff that happens around it, is really strong. Yeah, and I think it's about the cases and less so the courtroom. Right. And that's kind of, it's partly once he has his kind of turning his new leaf and going, I'm going to do, you know, what's right and not necessarily what's best for my career. That is kind of why those courtroom scenes aren't as critical as they are in other courtroom dramas and law shows because in those other ones, it's like a lot of the plot has to do about the main character upward mobilizing up the law firm's ladder. Whereas in this one, it's almost about him stepping down yeah. and taking, you know, a step away from his work and thinking about how is my work implicating the bigger picture. And so that's something that I think in this show you see a lot of because he gets a lot of the feedback after his cases and even the ones where he kind of wins over the other side and they're like we're actually just going to settle this because you kind of moved us like that's like more important to this show's plot than you know like there's not a lot of memorable judges or yeah any like rapport or relationship with like Later on in like the second season, like half of the people leave and join another law firm. But typically in other legal shows, there's kind of like, you know, combative law firms that kind of are, the, we're working against these people and they're stealing our cases and stuff like that. And that kind of happens later, but it's not as critical. 
to the show's central plot. So, yeah, I think this is a very strong pilot. I think the only caveat is, yeah, obviously the content <laughs> of this one, especially in the times we are living in, is a bit controversial. It was, it was kind of like weird going back to something and being like, wow, didn't really hit that hit me then. And it hits me real hard now. <laughs> <laughs> like a ton of bricks. Um, but the other episode we watched, we actually watched a couple from the first season. And I think it's good to note that the two seasons, you could almost watch them separately. They're not ones like you do have to watch the episodes in order. It is kind of tough when you skip them. We found that out rewatching the show and being like having to kind of go back for a little plot point. So you do get plot mobility be between each episode but the f the series or series the season long plot lines are good enough to where like you could watch them either way you get a lot of information from season two that would make you watch season one a little differently because season one is kind of him getting into being this prophet and season two is kind of finding out why he was chosen in a way so you could kind of watch i'm sure there's a way to like guide that up specifically like some other tv nerds have for other shows where they're like if you watch these episodes in order like you kind of like understand everything a little bit more <laughs> but the other season one episodes we watched the next one up is season one episode five that's called one more try and similar enough to what we were talking about just now is the main point of this episode is he's able to retry a case and he's kind of, he gets these visions and he's kind of like, what part of this case do I really need to do? And how do I make this outcome different than when I did it before? And it was very much a him working on behalf of corporate the first time around. And this time he needs to, even though he has to be on the same side he was before, in a weird way he's trying not to win so that's like that is very reflective of why like the courtroom stuff is very different in this show than in other legal shows because he's following his visions instead of his drive because so yeah that's that's something that i did really like about this episode uh yeah and, and that's something that that's really thematic to to the series and thematic, especially to season one, the only thing so far that I have seen in the show uh, up to this point that like shows that it's that their actual visions from God specifically that is through like the spiritual kind of like guidance of uh, Dr. Frank Chen's character, right? Like yeah. as his kind of compass in that, but it's not overt yet. It it seems to come no. become far more overt in the second season like when yeah. why he's getting the visions is explained that's not overt yet it, it's mainly it's it's a lot to do with his own morality this is th this episode's a lot to do with with redos um yeah and redemption about turning that car around <laughs> exactly every character has this like kind of little even side plot uh even one of the more antagonistic firm partners uh has like a yeah. little moment of humanity here with with a mistake that he made several years ago having to do in this episode that that he can't undo uh whereas a lot of things like Eli's struggling with this whole I want to be this new man after these visions and and this is the episode that he has to show up because he hasn't been doing that yet this episode yeah. was kind of reminiscent for me of a, of a series we discussed in primetime party time, uh, episode three, Angel. This, this had a lot of like yes. Wolfram and Hart vibes where everybody within the firm, like we, uh, a character that wasn't in the pilot that seems to be in all the other episodes, uh, Maggie. Yes. Maggie is like this young attorney who's looking up to uh, Eli Stone, who's looking up to the, the prosecutors trying to get settlement uh, for a possible defect car crash uh, that ruined some lives. And, like, she's another moral compass for Eli in this episode, uh, as well, trying not to, like, lose her own... Um, trying not to get cynical about her own work yeah. environment. And so you see a lot of good people performing these acts for, like, this this kind of, like, bad 
entity, right? And and how can they work from within the system to make the system better? Which is something that the series continues to explore, but it's especially prevalent in this episode. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, uh, speaking of continuity, fun Veronica Mars <laughs> reference in this episode. A little name drop shout out. Yeah. And also Maggie is played by an actress who was on season three and the final episode of Veronica Mars. Uh, Maggie is played by, yes. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, if you can say the name again since I talked over oh, a little bit. Uh, Julie Gonzalo is uh, Maggie go. Decker on uh, and yeah. whoever she was on Veronica Mars. I don't think I saw any of her episodes. Yeah, she played Parker Lee. So she's in the, the college years season and then she goes on to be in the in the later season but yeah fun little nod to other shows that we have covered and also her character is another one of the ways that she's kind of the ingenue that wants to do right is i remember in one of the early scenes of this episode she's like trying to cut down copies and she ends up to like be more environmentally focused and the head of the firm is like, actually, we get to bill people more based on the copy. So uh, I need those copy numbers to go up. But you can see, like, that's an example of people from within the system being like, what can I do? Like, what even what small part can I do to make this a better place in our larger kind of corporate ecosystem? And I think fighting against corporate greed is a major theme in this show. It's kind of seems like that's kind of his lawyer purpose is and it seems like also that's the opposite of what his purpose was before. Like he definitely fought on the side of corporate way more often. And he I mean, it gets to a point where he really is kind of going and back back and forth with like whose side is he on for different cases because he follows the whims of his visions and not what he should be doing for his career and for his firm and that definitely causes tension within the other characters in the show like even his brother with like the hospital and different procedures they do for him health wise that some are very like you know chances are not looking good for him but he has to like insist because he has certain visions that like it'll work out and that's that's kind of hard definitely for <laughs> medical professionals to be like um i should risk this and risk being sued for malpractice by a lawyer patient <laughs> <laughs> so it's you do see them like they don't you know hide how many hurdles he kind of goes over but it is also helpful that his brother is a doctor so he does help him out and he yeah in the season two episodes that we cover he plays a large role in there too but i think my favorite episode of the series is season one episode nine i want your sex this is when a girl plays this song by george michael i want your sex during an abstinence only sex education rally that was at her school and george michael makes a guest appearance on the show where many of the episodes feature his songs and his singing so it was cool that he actually got to be on here in the flesh. Yeah. And then he comes to like, rep you know, kind of finance this case because he's passionate as well about it. And it is good seeing the show kind of like, because if we're looking at like the pilot and them taking a, a point that is like a bit controversial now and kind of a talking point for like far to the right politics this is one where it kind of shifts over and even though he gets a lot of like divine intervention it's not necessarily always on like the side of being conservative it's more on the side of being ethical and that's what you see in this one because it's more about this girl saying hey i've seen other classmates suffer really poorly because of the lack of actual facts and education here and then george michael takes the stand and goes I wrote this song a lot about, you know, people who weren't getting information or any resources during AIDS in the 80s. And so I really sympathize with what this girl's doing. And I think this would make, you know, America a better place. And you're just like, I love George Michael. 
rest his soul I love his <laughs> yeah. music so like and like got to see him do many performances he even sings at the end and you're just like oh it makes you just want to go on and binge on george michael playlists all night long that's and but this is a very fun episode too like it's when him and the victor garber character are kind of at odds but they kind of come together in this episode and because this one is a lot about free speech as well and freedom of religion and all these things the head of the law firm gets really re-energized by taking on this case and they're just like i haven't had this much fun in law in a very long That's time true. during That's, this week yeah the show yeah there, there's a very very like strong trajectory of victor garber's character uh, yeah. as one of the partners and this is the first time that he just he's he does kind of feel reinvigorated about what it means to be in the courtroom and what people are fighting for uh it's also really fun though like you said to have george michael come in and interpret his own art in a courtroom setting uh, yes. that, that was that was pretty great uh the b plot for this episode's like super dark and intense um oh yeah <laughs> yeah and and again is another is another one of those like redemption sort of like everything matters uh you know redo kind of uh plot lines in, in a way and uh yeah this this one was one of the fun ones this is like the standout episode of the show this is when eli's visions uh kind of stop like stop being visions for an episode and like yeah it's it's just george michael in the flex yes flex. and he does like a high school show at the end of it and you're just like looking at this crowd of teens that are like, nah! <laughs> and then the law firms gets to be there too. It's really fun. I think also it's representative more of the first season because the first season has a lot more, first of all, actual George Michael presence. Most episodes feature one of his songs and him bursting into song. So you do kind of wonder like who had the in with George Michael on this show <laughs> that right. like got him to just do all of it. Cause it's pretty much like they start out obviously with the song faith. That's also the intro of the final episode of the series. They play faith again. So it is in a way like the light motif of this show because it is all about him having faith and he loves George Michael. So <laughs> it's just going to be like, it's, I think also supposed to be one of these like recurring figments of his imagination that's supposed to kind of take the form of his visions. And you'll kind of start to see that. That was also a similar tactic on Ally McBeal. She would consistently see Al Green or Aretha Franklin or different singers based on like kind of what she was going through so that this show definitely shares a lot of like nods like I don't think we could have this show without having an Ally McBeal I think you know they're from different time periods so that one was a lot more about the 90s and up and sexual harassment and mental health and this one's a lot more about spirituality and ethics and in a way you can also kind of compare it to angel but it's a lot more about if that show is about the senior partners right <laughs> yeah. this one is more of that like kind of life and death do happen in the courtroom kind of thing so and that's why and it's and it's funny because like him and his brother are a lawyer and a doctor and like they kind of are showing how these two make a lot of difference in their rights like being in these two different paths that kind of do come and intertwine, which leads into season two, yeah. episode six. So season Happy two, birthday, Nate. Seems a little. Season two seems a lot faster. Uh, it does, and it seems to to get a lot more. Uh, it, it's more plot heavy, I guess. Like you see the direction the show is going. Um, also, uh, the episodes are no longer uh, titled after George Michael songs, and George Michael seems absent. Uh, minus yeah, that's the, a complaint the of, the... of mine. For the, <laughs> <laughs> the second season, I'd say my biggest criticism is why was there less George Michael in this season? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy that part of this show. Um, yeah, the second so season yeah. really does seem to be heavier and less campy. I would say mm. like the first season, you definitely get the same sort of feel as what 
a recent show like Zoe Extraordinary Playlist. It's a lot of like breaking into song and kind of like fumbling through personal relationships and workplace stuff. And this one is getting a lot more high stakes in each episode. So for instance, this one is a lot of flashback going back to their childhood with their father. And it's about like his uh, his brother Nate's birthday. And there was like a birthday where his dad is an alcoholic and he kind of drops the ball on the whole birthday part. What they don't know at the time is that he was also getting all these visions. And then that was kind of his way of coping because it's like hard to kind of grasp your presence in this world is to be like this prophet and then he also is at the simultaneously like working on all of these materials like there's like this book that they have like information for the boys to know later and you do find out in this season too that frank chen knew their father as well yeah, that's a big and was kind of coaching him too so it's it's almost like he's this like yeah like this kind of like spirit guide you know for all of these prophets that are almost in a lineage you're kind of getting into like da vinci code territory mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit but yeah so and then at the same time the case in this show is also about kind of a tense relationship between a boy and his father it's about this kid who's sick but he also kind of has a bit of tendencies to kind of lash out in self-destructive ways and he wants to be emancipated from his father because his father wants to use him for this case study that would hopefully cure him of his illness and so there's a lot of these like well-intentioned parent well-intentioned kid the relationship is still like very rocky and that's very much a mirror to the relationship that Eli and Nate had with their father where they have all these warm memories but they're also really soured by his absence and like what was he using all of his time for and they're kind of piecing it together now and you do look at this show a lot of is kind of like a really positive way of looking at a maybe I had a horrible relationship with this parent because they were really doing these you know bigger and better things that I had no insight onto you do kind of get that vibe of the show of like maybe it's supposed to kind of like comfort some people and some of the viewers in that way. So that's, that's a big part of this episode is finding out like Frank Chen's kind of relationship to his whole family and also his brother's experience. Cause his brother also gets like hints from Frank that Eli's not allowed to know of like what his, who he had got like a letter from his father that was like dated back to his 12th birthday that he was allowed to read now. And it was all about kind of their destiny and all the things that they would achieve. But a big part of this episode was saying his father wrote to Nate saying like, Eli won't be able to do any of this great stuff that he's kind of destined to do without all of your help. Like your help is very pivotal to him being able to enact these visions. So just know that like you're not just in his shadow. And so it always seems like Nate has this a lot bitter relationship and memory of their father and in this episode it isn't fully redeemed but I think he kind of goes hmm I will I will give this more thought than just completely writing off yeah the father. something something that's really great about like the Eli and Nate and and honestly as an extension Frank characters is that they all sort of like ground each other and especially yeah. in scenarios where their feelings are about the the father character um, like oftentimes Eli has to go to Nate, uh, for, for advice or to Frank for advice. And then oftentimes, uh, especially during these fallouts, like, you know, Eli is able to bring Nate down about their father. And as the plot line with Frank develops, and especially into season two, episode 12, Tailspin, uh, yeah. they all do, there, there's this really great scene where uh, Nate actually has to come to Eli uh, after the three of them have a falling out. And and Eli calls Nate a jerk because he was the bigger man and came to apologize first and, and kind of bring everybody back into the fold. Uh, what What yeah. is this fight over? Like, how does this progress um, through, like, the three of theirs' relationships with the father? 
So for this one, I think this is showing a lot of how much more divine intervention was in their lives than they realized. I think that's a big part of how we see these intertwining and how it's another episode where the courtroom is all about like, are we doing corporate greed? Are we not? How do we fight against this? And Eli is put in there again. And it's also a flashback to the way his father's demise happened. And it's about him getting this vision of a plane crashing and he wasn't able to save everyone. He was able to convince a certain amount of people to get off a flight. And you can think about that in real life terms. And I think, you know, it's, it's weird, like thinking of that and then going, Arr! but like, it's, that's kind of like why his dad kind of had a difficult time afterwards being like, how do I cope with, I wasn't able to save everyone, mm-hmm. which is a big part that Eli has difficulty later when in his, in the final episode of this series, he gets the same vision of the plane crash as well as like this woman in white and how do they deal and how does he save everyone? How does he do the right thing when he can't decode all of these messages all at once? And he saves as many people as he can, but he doesn't save one person. And he finds out later that that is because like he's, oh, well, there's like, it was kind of, it's hard to explain without explaining everything. But basically there's a woman he was trying to save who was an atheist who was supposed to receive the heart because she had a condition where she needed to have a heart transplant of a Christian girl. The parents didn't really want to, didn't think that would be in the girl's wishes until they read some letters. And so then she was supposed to get this heart transplant. And then she ended up, you know, having a complication. And so while he saved everyone because Maggie was supposed to get on this plane and because she asked to get off and no one else did, they did a recheck of the plane and they were like, if we didn't recheck this, this would have exploded in the sky. Which like, <laughs> oh. no. uh, you're, it's a time, the only time where you're like, I'm glad I'm watching this in a time where I'm not traveling all the time because anxiety, yes. Yeah. Um, I really hope somebody on the plane is like, you know, you always want the air marshal. Now I want there to be a prophet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's like, a big part of like her going like, ah, and like, you know, we kind of work together on this message. And at this point of the show too, a, part, a lot of season two is like more people are getting brought in on the secret, which I think there does seem to be a lot of shows of this time period of like people having some sort of workplace secret and getting like kind of let in on it. It's kind of like that show Psych where he has like the really good memory, but he tells everyone he's psychic and like people you know, slowly but surely get to know the secret. Mm -hmm. Same with like suits, same with, you know, there's, there's kind of like a good rack up. Um, Also all the mystical shows where they pretend not to be a superhero or a witch or whatever, where it's like sometimes either no one finds out or it's like the circle of trust begins to widen (laughs) and then the more people are in on it. And that's what kind of happens towards the end. Like he kind of has his assistant making sure everyone in the law firm is fine. But, you know, if you're looking at the episode right before that, it's him kind of coming to terms with like, my dad wasn't able to handle this. Will I? And that is kind of the cliffhanger that the series finale leaves you with is he kind of can, but he's also sets his own terms of like, I don't really want it to continue this way. Um, don't really want you to just kind of like test me with putting people in like death traps in the sky and hoping that I figure out how to undo them. And uh, would really like you to also not like do that for me or be like, we're saving this heart for your soulmate who isn't really like other than the main namesake episode grace in season two you don't get a lot of her presence and then maggie is definitely the will they won't they love interest of this show and it does make you wonder like what 
the message of the show is about soulmates. Like, is he supposed to eventually end up with this Grace character? Or does the fact that he loves Maggie, is that kind of his free will to yeah, do so what he wants? I'm interested in how you took it. Because, I mean, I'm all, I'm all down for, like, a fiction trying to trying to tackle the, the, the soulmate yeah. idea. Um, there's know. actually this really, really great uh, Hindi movie from 2016 called Dear Zindagi. It's a Shadok Khan movie. And it has a really, really great idea about soulmates, uh, which is, is totally an aside. Uh, but okay. the and, and I highly recommend watching that. Uh, but from I, I did kind of skip around and 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 you know gauge the finale. But obviously, I was missing a lot of context, uh, not knowing the Grace character, not even knowing if the character who has to die and give up her heart is a, a major player in the series or not. And then obviously. Uh, the scenes that I saw with Maggie and Eli and, and a lot of the episodes we watched, they're, they're somewhat separated. Um, she has a lot yeah. of scenes with other characters. Uh, and so he was like her mentor in the, in the episode I watched. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't really see the progression of the, the will they, won't they, uh, that I'm positive is there. So my question is, is like, you've, you've seen all that, that yeah. all that, 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 that is all like, you know, not tangible for me. It's tangible for you. What, what are your thoughts on how they tackle that? What did you see? So in the first season, he's engaged to Taylor. And yes. like that's falls apart real quick. Own... Oh yes. <laughs> no, that's that's, that's all I had to say. It just falls apart real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's engaged to Taylor. You know, it's always good to stop for a sipping break. Um, but he you know, and they kind of fumble with like breaking off an engagement because that's not an easy thing to do. So, and it's kind of because after he realizes this new identity, he also realizes like, oh, I think I was, you know, marrying this person for the wrong reasons. I think I'm not like that in love with her, which is pretty hurtful when you think about it. Uh, Cause I think they like the context is like they dated for a long time. So, and she is the daughter of his boss. Yeah. So it's not a lightly taken decision. Everyone ends the, the, up kind the, of. Uh, not only just his boss, Victor Garber's character, Jordan, who he spends the most yes. time with. Yeah. Most of his time is spent with his boss slash kind of his mentor is him. Yeah. yeah and yeah. then that's kind of how that, that's where they start to have a bit of a falling out. And then he moves on to kind of like him and Maggie kind of have this mentor mentee relationship, but then you also do see some sparks flying, but you do see them both kind of date other people. And, but you kind of have that hope of like, Oh, they'll realize like this, what they have here is what is most you know important to them. I think that's what you see as a viewer. But then when grace comes into play, you're very confused and like, how does she fit into all this? Like maybe he's meant to be with her. But I think in, by the time I got to the series finale, and I'll say this without watching a lot of season two, there could be some holes that would have been plugged in if I did a full viewing. But I think from there and from this viewing experience, you do kind of get the idea of since he ends the series with saying like, I'm going to start calling some of the shots. And he says like, I love Maggie in there you're kind of thinking like maybe he's going to call his own shots and be like i want to be with the person i don't want to be with not who i'm destined to be with and see how oh, that plays out okay. because in other parts of the show he kind of goes against what he's supposed to be doing with the visions and you see the pros and cons and the consequences of when he goes against the word but so we're I rejecting think, the idea yeah and so it's kind of interesting because I think this show plays with a lot of like big picture ideas. And I it think does. soulmates would be another one of like, do you believe in soulmates? Do you not? And he started off as a very cynical character. So you could see the reality that he kind of goes, well, I really know this girl and I really like her and I in fact love her. So why would I feel like I, you know, even though I had a kind of like great chance experience episodic experience in this sense with this woman like why should I end up with her but it's hard because you've also seen an example of him being very certain about someone and then being wrong with right. the case of Taylor 
So it does kind of leave you wondering. Okay, I'm seeing this. Who now. does he end up with? Because and does he know what's right for him? Because she, Excuse. yeah, no, totally. And and like while he was sort of like taking Maggie under the wing for the the, the case in the early season one episode, she's a big part of in like she's a big influence yeah. on him and who he's wanting to be throughout the series. She she's there for the right we- reasons, and she pushes him. Uh, to be the the person that deep down he is trying to be throughout the series. So I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that for sure. Yeah, it's an interesting take. And you do kind of wonder, like, where would this show have landed if they got a third season? Yeah. Because it is wrapped up pretty nicely. Like, they did. Like, I do wonder if that is why a lot of season two is, like, heavy, heavy plot is if they knew they were only getting a second season. And so they had to make as much happen in that amount of space yeah. but at the same time you could see the next season be a little bit more about where does he end up individually because a lot of it mm-hmm. this one has been about him saving people and then at this one you also realize that the who he saves also has to do a lot with his destiny so it does make you think like well where the you know chess piece is going next i think it is one though where you watch two seasons and you go like this was a really nice show like you you are you do feel complete i think they did a really good job of that where it's like it is wrapped up there's like a little bit of cliffhanger and like where he ends up but that's okay because you can plug that in a little bit but yeah it is it is a show that you do kind of have most of your answers in there but i think you do kind of think about like where what other directions they could have taken if they had the time but yeah it's it's a very like it's interesting to see it in the in contrast with a lot of shows now and being i think this is another one of those shows where it was maybe like if it wasn't a network show i could see it being on streaming yeah i don't know how this isn't a network show though i don't this is one of those like right place right time series in my mind like it it, and it's weird because it's also it's like this i don't know i don't know if this show exists under any different conditions uh yeah and it is kind of like this it's yeah and also like contextually like outside of the actual content of the show it's very much like a stepping stone series uh, yes. it, 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 it's very, very indicative of how the Arrowverse kind of comes about and like who ends up on that. And, and it's, it's a lot of the creators figuring out what they want to say in their work. Um, and, and, and it is like, I don't know, it's great. It's, it's, it's about a lot. And that's actually one of my favorite parts about this show is yeah, it's a lot of these high concept, like late two thousands network shows they're forgotten because they're not about anything. There's nothing at their core. This one's all about figuring stuff out. It's all about trusting. It's all about things coming back around and wisdom and spirituality and instinct and time and the rejection of noise and finding truth and meaning. It's hearts in the right place. Uh, But I just don't know, like, I don't know. I don't know if this show, like, uh, I agree. It would be a more nuanced show in a streaming environment i don't know if it would exist in a streaming environment though i don't think it would exist in the same way yeah i could see like this show getting adapted and becoming like bigger and potentially explicit if it was on a streaming platform i think the way it is now it's in this kind of like in the same way it's like a stepping stone for the creators it is reaching that stepping stone of like these quirky high concept shows that are like clearly smart enough to get airtime to have an audience but how do we make those you know for like this is clearly for like the cult follow niche audience and not necessarily the same people who kind of just turn on something because it's 9 p.m right like this is definitely for people who are like i watched the show and the writing was great and george michael's on it all the time (laughs) and it's just like a really out there but at the same time very heartwarming so mm-hmm. it i can see how this show fits a lot of people and they'd really like it but i also see how it is 
yeah, it does narrow in a lot, even though, as you've said, at its core are like these giant notions, but it does have like all these like very specific bits. And it's kind of like, do you like George Michael? Do you like going on a spiritual journey? Yeah, seriously. (laughs) Do you like the courtroom and legal drama, but not too much drama? And also a bit of, you know, disasters. Yeah. And if you do want disasters and if you want less spirituality and if you want more drama and more sensationalism, Shark was airing at the same time. So you can always split <laughs> the channel and go watch that. Exactly. Do you have any more? I mean, I oh. think, yeah, no, they I were just... trying to they were trying to get that in between group. And like you said, it was right after Lost. And I think they were trying to segue up to this group and also i think a lot of it was ally mcbeal was a really successful show and they might have been looking at like hey that was a really benchmark quirky comedy that a lot of people have a really strong relationship with what if we made something similar but also unique in its own and you know because a lot of television pitches are let's look at something that's worked but then let's you know update it with some new ideas and i could see that too because it is it does have its own like we don't see a lot of shows that have this like spiritual theme to them Mm -hmm. so i think that is a part that makes the show really unique and it's i feel like it was at a time where it was kind of like hope a- aka the 2008 campaign <laughs> for Obama <laughs> and so like there was like a little bit of this like oh yeah like we're feeling really good about the direction of things like people are working within the system to make it better like so I think there is a part of that that plays in the cultural moment is also why the show lasted so I think that's where I kind of go back around and I agree with you it needed to happen at the time that it did happen at I also, though, think it should be, like, my one plea is that, like, I do think it should be on, like, a Netflix yeah, or the, something. The show deserves I think this, treatment. This like show a, deserves to get treatment. watched yeah. on a better platform in order to have more of a following. I, was I think that, it's you know, much... the fact that it's hidden will keep it hidden. So It's a much more nuanced, coherent, complete show then I was going to give it credit for finding it on abc.com. Yes. Now, and it does almost feel like as kind of what we've been kind of mulling on here, like a mini series type Mm -hmm. vibe. Like you feel through these two seasons and you're like, I get what they were trying to accomplish here. It's an, it's nice. You do like, there is a little bit of rushness in the second season, but at the same time, they're a bit standalone. So I think it works. Yeah, I do too. Anything else on uh, Eli Stone? No, but I encourage everyone to go watch it. This is definitely a show that you can be the first one in your friend group to watch. <laughs> that is so and true. And then <laughs> I can't believe we had two. Urge others. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had two. That's, that's <laughs> yes. amazing. Uh, okay, well, that's it for this week's primetime party time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to Plop, BMAC, Just the Facts, Sup. Uh, everybody else, uh, the show couldn't have been made without the following amazing people. Uh, you know them, and if you don't, you should know them. Uh, artwork by Fen at Fen Latte on Instagram. Theme song playing in the background, jwright at jwrightmusic.com. Website by Coco. Uh, hope your uh, hand heals soon so you can play some sexy oh, yes. sax man with us on the next Can You Play or Can You Still Play That? Please and, do. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. Find us on any of. Uh, the podcast platforms of your choosing. If you can't, uh, you know where to find us. We got an email. We got a voicemail here on the on ptptshow.com Monday nights, 9 p.m. See you next time. See you next time, guys. Keep doing your primetime party time dance to this outro.
<laughs> we were pre recorded last week. I don't even remember how we end the show. Hey. <laughs> Keeping it fresh yep. every week. Oh, that's good. That's good. All right. I, th- I think it's this fader. I think it's this fader. Oh, there you go.